Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here today and to, uh, I want to say how much we appreciate Ivy Tech in terms of its willingness to uh, host many of these roadshow uh, meetings. They've been so impressive and so important, and Ivy Tech is uh, such a great resource for the community. Uh, I also want to thank the mayor because he's absolutely right. I mean, part of the recognition of, um, of the problem is essentially having leadership say, you know, here's an issue and we got to do something about it. And it's, it's, uh, it's one thing to talk about it, it's another thing to do it. So uh, thank you for your leadership, Mayor. And I just want to also say um, that we have appreciated working with Dr. Spear and the Health Department. I'm Paul Halverson, I'm the uh, founding dean of the Richard M. Fairbanks School of Public Health at Indiana University. Um, and I, I came here uh, to Indiana uh, actually to start the School of Public Health. I'm the founding dean, but I came having been the health commissioner in Arkansas for eight years and having been at CDC for about a similar period of time. Uh, before that, I was a hospital um, CEO, so I think I've, um, uh, one would say I've probably failed well at all, all three of those, um, but I'm, I'm really here uh, today because I believe so much in the power of our communities uh, to really uh, take care of this disconnect. And Dan, thank you so much for your comments because I do, do believe that at the end of the day, this is a huge disconnect. This doesn't fit the Hoosier mentality or our, our, our customs uh, and the ethic that we have. And, and so, you know, we really do have a great health care system in our state. Uh, we have a lousy health status. And at the end of the day, even if you have uh, uh, all the money in the world, if you don't have your health, what's the use? Uh, my dad always used to remind me that they don't have too many uh, uh, hearses with trailer hitches for all the money that you're going to take with you. Uh, the reality is it doesn't matter until, unless you have your health. And so that's why uh, the healthy, um, uh, Healthier Indiana was formed was actually creating the opportunity uh, for uh, those of us that care deeply about Indiana and who care a lot about health uh, to come together and say, we can change this. So we're really a group of uh, dedicated people um, who really have a passion uh, to make a change. The Indiana Hospital Association, the Indiana Chamber of Commerce, the Indiana State Medical Association, Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield, um, and these are just uh, some of the uh, early partners. There's just tremendous outpouring of support. Um, and I, I would also add our School of Public Health to that list. Um, and you might ask the question, so why now? Uh, the reality is, and this is what's been interesting for me, is uh, as a relative newcomer to Indiana, um, when we review the statistics and we talk with people all over the state, the fact that we have these rankings, 34th worst in drug deaths, 40th in obesity, 41st in smoking, 50% higher than the U.S. average, 42nd in infant mortality, 49th in public health. In fact, that 49th, I'll give you a little hint on that. No one does worse than Indiana in getting grants from CDC. No one. And yet, our state health com a former state health commissioner used to be the deputy director at, at uh, CDC. I used to be at CDC. Uh, it's not a great badge to have that we get, we have the least amount of money that comes to Indiana. In, in, in part, it's because some of these grants actually are non-competitive grants. We're, we're just missing out, in some cases, on the, the funding that's, that's really necessary to strengthen our state. And so as a consequence, uh, when we look at these numbers, interestingly enough, many people in Indiana are not surprised, but they don't know what to do about it. And so that's why the alliance was formed, and that's uh, hopefully why we're all here today, is to think through, what can we do about this? <clears throat> so what's at stake in particular, um, the, the issue of tobacco. Um, the reality is that there are a lot of things on this list, and, and I can give you a list of probably three times that number of, uh, in terms of statistics and factors, 
But at the end of the day, the number one cause of preventable death in Indiana is related to tobacco use. And I know the argument is pretty popular, which is, you know what, if I don't smoke, if someone else does, that's their problem. Why should I care? Why you should care is, is for is a number of reasons, and we'll talk about it, but at the end of the day, it really creates uh, for us an enormous opportunity because our, the prevalence of smoking in Indiana is so high, it is really causing our health system to be overloaded with a number of chronic diseases and other uh, maladies which frankly complicate everything else. And so that's why uh, the Alliance chose to uh, focus on, on uh, tobacco use first. So again, uh, the reality is one in five Hoosiers still smoke. 15% of Hoosier women smoke while pregnant. And in some of our counties, it's as high as 32% of uh, pregnant women still smoking. And we know that one of the leading causes of prematurity and um, a whole host of, of, uh, of birth defects and uh, uh, problems with infants are related to uh, the complications of smoking during pregnancy. And the other issue that we know is true is that 95% of adult smokers started before age 21. So substantially reducing tobacco use in our state would have a profound impact on costs this number here is real. Uh, we've, we've scrubbed through it. We've challenged ourselves as we looked at the number. And I, I'm willing to stake my reputation on the fact that this number is, is really substantial. And it's, uh, and it's something that we pay for every day. Regardless of where you live in our state, a part of that $7.6 billion is coming out of your check and mine. It's a cost that we, we can avoid if we choose to, but we have historically said that um, uh, you know, we're gonna spend that money. I think we could spend our money a whole lot more wisely. Um, so if we look at uh, our economy, visits to healthcare professionals are six times more for smokers than non-smokers. They're admitted to the hospital almost twice as often the average, uh, the average 1.4 additional days in the hospital per admission. And the, it is the, the, the cause uh, about two times greater lost productivity um, in, in terms of workers uh, than, in, in the estimate is about $27 billion. Someone figured it out actually, I think it was Kevin, the president of the, of the Indiana Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the average smoker gets almost three weeks of additional time off if you count up all of the smoke breaks that they take during the day and, uh, and all of the time that they lose because of illness related to smoking. That's a huge cost. Uh, it's, it's also not fair, by the way. Um, so if we look at tobacco use in Indiana, we lose about 11,100 adults every year in Indiana, that's 11,100 funerals that didn't need to happen. Uh, if we look at kids who are alive today who will die prematurely from smoking, it's 151,000 of our kids. The financial cost, and this is I think one of the things that really grabs me, for every pack of cigarettes sold in our state of Indiana, we'll spend $15.90 in healthcare costs related to smoking and lost productivity. So we sell the cigarettes for about $6 a pack, but we'll spend almost $16 a pack in medical costs and productivity loss. Um, we're not gonna make this up in volume. It, it just keeps getting worse. And so that's one of the reasons why when someone says, well, if, you know, I, if I'm smoking, who cares? Well, who cares is the reality of those costs which we all pay either through Medicaid in higher insurance premiums for employers and of course that lost productivity. Here's the other one that most people are a bit irritated by and I'm probably at the head of the line and that is that the estimate for tobacco company marketing expenditures in Indiana alone is around $294 million a year. 
per year. How much do you think we spend in tobacco prevention and cessation in Indiana? It's about $5 million, compared to almost $300 million in marketing expenses. <clears throat> so, tobacco use uh, remains a concerning and costly challenge to the health, um, quality of life, and economic development of our communities. The rate is about 21%. Uh, that makes it us 41st in the nation in terms of overall smoking. And here's the good news. The good news is we know how to fix this. We, we've chosen up to this point not to. But we really do know, and this is where we have enormous amount of, of research. And I'm a researcher, but I'm telling you, we don't need any more research to know what we need to do. Uh, there's a lar large body of scientific evidence and I, I, could, I could bring it all out and you could see it. Um, if we raise the price of a tobacco product, it will uh, definitely change the use. And I'll show you a graph here in a second to illustrate that point. This is probably one of the most difficult messages to get through to our <laughs> legislators, though. Because, you know, no, none of us in Indiana like a tax, right? Nobody. Our legislators, especially around election time, they hate it even worse. But the reality is, this is one of those uh, cases where the antidote for the problem is increasing the tax on tobacco. It increases the price and it substantially reduces the use. If we could also uh, enact comprehensive indoor air laws, they do work and they will reduce smoking use. In Indiana, we have some indoor air laws now. They are considered by most organizations that care about uh, health as being among the weakest in the country. And in fact, in many of the uh, hotel, or many of the meeting plan, our associations will not give Indiana credit for being a non-smoking state because our, we have so many loopholes and so many other, so many provisions that allow smoking that we don't, it doesn't count in a lot of uh, organizations. We can also restrict the um, age of buying tobacco to 21 years old, and I'll tell you why that's important in a second. And we can adequately fund our tobacco control program. Remember I said it's about $5 million we spend a year on tobacco prevention and cessation. CDC has done some extensive studies, and they estimate for our population we should be spending about $70 million a year on tobacco prevention and cessation. Seven, zero. We're spending five. I think actually if you add a couple of additional programs, we might be as high as seven nowadays. But the reality is it's, it's one-tenth of what we need to be spending. Uh, and then implementing counter-advertising campaigns. Those, uh, you've probably seen them on TV. How many of you have seen the CDC um, uh, ads that have uh, tips from former smokers. You know what? They work. They really do work. You know what the tobacco uh, company hates the worst? Those ads. Because those ads drive people to the quit line and quit line helps people quit smoking. <clears throat> so, there are hundreds of studies that demonstrate the effectiveness of cigarette price um, and in terms of lowering uh, consumption and increasing quitting. Now the important thing is, is if we, if we increase the price, we also have, in my view, an ethical responsibility to help people quit, right? So just raising the price and, and then walking away is not enough. We need to be prepared to help people be successful in quitting. And the good news is there's great evidence to suggest that we can help people make this uh, addiction, uh, deal with this addiction, which many of us would say is probably as, as, as difficult to beat as a cocaine addiction. It is extremely hard. In fact, most people quit 11 times before they're successful. So the reality is we can help people quit, and, and it, there are, there's good science to support it. Our health department uh, is very involved in it and, and that can make a big difference. So this is a graph actually looking at Indiana uh, when we increased, the last time we increased the price of tobacco, it, you can see the green line is the price and the, the darker line is the sales. So this, is, this isn't theoretical, this is what, are, what happened last time we increased the price. 
Unfortunately, that doesn't last forever. And you have to increase the price again to be able to get that same phenomenon to occur. By the way, there are a lot of other states that have done this. We're not experimenting. This really does work. It's probably the most effective way in which to reduce uh, tobacco use. Here's the United States, just to show you that it works all over. Um, by the way, there are some states now and some cities where a pack of cigarettes is now as high as $12 to $13 per pack. You know what happens to consumption when it gets that high? <laughs> consumption goes down dramatically. So here's another issue, and I know this is also something that may be new to some of you, but most smokers would never take up the habit if access were delayed until 21. You want to know why? Because of the fact, a couple reasons, but one of the most important reason is where do you think, you know, tobacco is illegal for kids under 18, but most of kids that buy tobacco have someone between 18 and 21 buy the tobacco for them. If you increase the age to 21, there are a lot of kids that, a lot of 18 year olds or 17 uh, year olds that know 18, 19, and 20 year olds, but there are very few. 17-year-old kids that know people over 21 that will buy tobacco products. So by increasing the age, you cut off the supply. And that's a substantial barrier for kids using tobacco. And 80% of smokers begin daily smoking uh, before age 21. And so again, if we can focus on trying to reduce their access, reduce to tobacco prevalence before they get to 21, chances are they won't start after 21. So I know the argument, which is, well, if you can go uh, enlist in the army and, and, and lay down your life for your country, why shouldn't you be able to smoke? Well, in part, any of us that have had teenagers can tell you why that is. The, the teenage brain is not fully developed at 18, and we don't make effective choices until the, the brain gets more formed and we, can, we actually have greater control in making, making better choices. And the other thing is what we have talked about with the military folks is that they have begged us, please do not create some military exception because we have a horrible problem recruiting people into the armed forces anyway and if they come through basic training they can't smoke anyway. So the reality is you know, the, the, this whole notion of military and, and so forth, uh, uh, being able to be in the military in, 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 at 18 uh, is really a very spurious argument, but it's one that you will hear. So are we alone in this? Well, the reality is 33, 330 cities already have implemented Tobacco 21 in their city or their county. The reality is in Indiana, we can't do it on a city or county basis because we have preemption laws that were uh, supported in large part by our tobacco companies that restrict our ability to take those kinds of actions independent of the state. So it has to be a state decision in Indiana if we're going to move in this direction. Tw um, so the reality is this has happened in 330 cities and counties in 21 states. And we now have six states where they've done it across the state. So there is hope, I believe, that this kind of an initiative could have, be successful in our state, and I know it would have a substantial impact. So Tobacco 21 properly implemented. The Institute of Medicine estimates in the first five years it would uh, have a 25% drop in youth smoking initiation. 12% drop in overall smoking rates, and 16,000 cases of preterm uh, birth and low uh, birth weight uh, babies, um, 4.2 million years of life lost prevented in our kids uh, uh, that are alive today. So again, if a man has never smoked by age 18, the odds are 3 to 1, he never will. By age 24, the odds are 20 to 1. So you see how important it is that we uh, try to prevent the initiation of smoking at, the, at an earlier age, and that gives us the best chance. There are a number of other priorities, and, and we'll hear more about it today, and it's just terrific. It's so wonderful being in Evans, Evansville to hear of all the great things you're doing. Infant mortality, uh, opioid use, 
obesity, um, and we could add a number of other issues to the list. Again, thank you for all that you're doing in this area. Um, but the reality is that if we want to make a change in our health, we can do it. Um, and I know that uh, with your support uh, and your communication with policymakers, helping them to understand uh, the consequences of some of our policy, um, that it can make a big difference. I'll leave you with one last uh, message, and that is that uh, if you look at our life expectancy, in the last century, the life expectancy in America went up by 30 years. 30 years. We we're living 30 years longer. Uh, 25 of those years came from, in, from initiatives focused in public health. About five years improvement because of our improvement in medical care systems. But those 25 years came as a result of policy initiatives uh, from public health. Things like uh, cleaning up the water supply, improving um, policies related to driving and seat belt use and so forth, immunizations. Uh, the, the smoking regulation while no one likes taxes, is one of those ways in which we can drastically improve the quality of life and reduce disease and expense in Indiana. So I, I wanted to give you the facts so that you understood the direction that we would like to go, at least in this first year. There are a lot of other things that we can do. Thank you so much for your attention this morning.